This is CBC Here and Now. Stay away from the cell phone. Put the cell phone down. Come across a crash? This fire chief wants drivers to stop putting first responders in danger. And playing on, Brigus hosts a ball tournament in memory of two young people killed last month near Bellevue. The field has been used in 20 years, and why not name it the Mikey Ryan Memorial Tournament? Step aside soccer, why so many parents and kids are picking up a squash racket. The program here has definitely developed and has picked up over the past few years. It's weekend time, of course, keeping an eye on the forecast, especially those winds. It's the final weekend for the food fishery. The details ahead. Well, we had a wartime love story last night and tonight a wartime mystery. Decades ago, Steve Brace's dad made an unusual discovery in an unlikely place at the St. John's dump. Yeah, now Brace is trying to solve the mystery of a piece of World War I memorabilia and learn more about the Newfoundlander it belonged to. Here now is Mark Quinn has that story. This is Private Herbert Lewis Ryan. He died near the end of World War I in August of 1918. This photo was taken more than a century ago. His parents were Naomi and Robert from Beta Verde, Blackhead area, just north of Carbonear. Steve Brace's father, Sandy Brace, rescued this photo from the St. John's dump in the 1990s. Shame was the biggest word that he used. He was ashamed That's, that was lying around in the dump. And saddened and like I said, he had the same goal. He wanted to return it to a relative. But through the jigs and reels, he never got around to it. But he never threw the photo away. Respect for the military runs deep in the Brace family. My father's a longtime Army uh, veteran. He was in for about 40 years, I suppose. And I served myself not for nearly that long, just a few years when I was in my uh, early 20s. Now, Brace, who also has a letter detailing that Ryan died in action, is picking up where his father left off. Well, I'm hoping that uh, there's a great uh, nephew or a niece or great grandson, I don't know, a relative that will appreciate this and hold it dear to them and maybe hand it down uh, for generations to come. Brace says he has a lead here in Newfoundland. He's making calls and hoping hoping that his efforts to save Private Ryan's memory will meet success. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, there was more tragedy on our highways this week when a 65-year-old man driving a motorcycle died near Butterpot Park on Wednesday. It's the latest in a string of deadly collisions, but is this a sign of a growing problem on our province's roads? Here now is Terry Roberts has been looking into this, and here's what he learned. 19 deaths on these roads since August 1st. For a while there, it was hard to keep up with all the bad news. Well, you may be surprised to know that the situation is not quite as bad as it's been in prior years. 26 highway deaths have occurred in RCMP jurisdiction this year. That's four fewer than last year at this time. And police say the number of collisions are also down. But one troubling trend this year multiple fatalities at crash sites. Four here last month, including a family of three. Three people died here less than three weeks ago. Days later, three more killed. But prior to August 1st, just seven deaths and some hopes that this pattern of carnage might be changing. Here's a look back at the numbers. It's gone from 50 two years ago to 28 so far this year. One thing that's not changing is the number of people dying who are not wearing a seatbelt. One police officer told me that number is as high as 30%. And despite the deaths and public campaign to try to reduce dangerous driving, things like this are still being seen. And even when a crash occurs, first responders like these say they often don't feel safe at the scene. Drivers distracted by their phones as they pass by in rare cases, yelling at firefighters trying to slow traffic. The nightmare scenario for me is that I go to the highway and at the end of that call, I've got to go knock on one of my firefighters' doors and, uh, and say that person's not coming home. You think about, you know, think about that for a second. 
And there's yet another big factor contributing to all this chaos on our roads, moose vehicle collisions. There's still about 600 of them every year in this province. So while we still have a long way to go to improve our driving, there's also a four-legged hazard out there that should keep us on our toes. Terry Roberts, CBC News, on the TCH near Come By Chance. Terry mentioned their drivers who refuse to get out of the way of emergency vehicles. In about 25 minutes, we'll have more from a first responder on the bad behavior he sees from drivers. And Terry also mentioned uh, one of those fatal accidents happened just last month near Bellevue. And tomorrow in Brigus, there will be a memorial softball tournament to remember two of the people who died in that accident. 11-year-old Mikey Ryan and 18-year-old Sarah Stride. Here now's Glenn Payette has more. It was an accident that shocked the province. A head-on collision that took the lives of Mike Ryan, his wife Paula, and their 11-year-old son, Mikey. And the life of the driver of the other vehicle, 18-year-old Sarah Stride. Now some folks are putting on a special event tomorrow in Brigus to remember softball-loving Mikey Ryan and animal lover Sarah Stride. We heard uh, the day that that happened, Mikey was on his way home from a ball tournament. And we had just started a league here on, in Brigus. The field hasn't been used in 20 years, and the weather's been so good, and we decided we were going to have a tournament. Why not name it the Mikey Ryan Memorial Tournament? Six teams will be taking part, and the money raised through registration, tickets, donations from businesses will be used to sponsor a kid's softball team. They will each have Mikey's number eight on their sleeves. Stride, who loved animals and people, will be remembered with a food drive for both so that every player that comes here to play ball or any, any outsiders, like, you know, just coming to see what's going on, uh, bring a non-perishable food and is either human or pet food. Dooley has an unusual connection to this story, having to do with Mikey's old cleats. His grandmother actually sells secondhand stuff, and I went to try on his cleats. And when I went there, she was actually on the phone trying to figure out where they were because she heard, had heard about the accident. I was actually trying on his softball cleats. She will pass them on to a kid who needs them. The game gets underway at noon. There will be face painting, carnival games, a jumpy castle, and more. Despite the tragedy that's led to this taking place, the organizers say it will not be a solemn event. They don't want it to be. Michael's sister, Rachel, will be here along with her grandparents. Glenn Payette, CBC News. Brigus. Well, Eastern Health says it is learning from what it calls a regrettable situation. And the health authority says it's adding new measures to avoid a repeat of this week's troubling incident. 18-year-old Nathan Brown went missing near the Health Sciences Center on Wednesday. He had left the hospital to return to his family's car. His father, Jason Brown, says a security guard approached Nathan and kicked him off the lot after complaints that someone was trying to break into parked cars. Brown says his son has mental health issues and is mostly nonverbal. The 18 year old spent the next 24 hours wandering around. Eastern Health is refusing to do an interview, but in a statement today, the health authority says it will provide extra mental health awareness training for security personnel. In addition, it says there will be a focus on the importance of professionalism and empathy when dealing with the public. Well, the Premier is moving up plans for an inquiry into Muskrat Falls. He now says an inquiry will be announced this fall. Just three months ago, Dwight Ball said the project wasn't far enough along. He didn't want to distract Nalcor, but after pressure from supporters and opponents, he's pulling the trigger. Nalcor has moved the project along another 5% in the last three months, which is good enough for the Premier. You know, there were a number of things then that had to be concluded around where the financing would be, getting some contracts in place, and so on. So the project is in a much different place right now. Uh, the transformers are all on site as an example. So, uh, you know, there's, the project is in much better shape right now with 83% complete. So uh, we're ready to call this inquiry this fall. So that uh, announcement came that after the uh, speech to the Liberal Party last night. And Peter, you were there. Uh, what was the Premier's message to the party? Well, yeah, Carolyn Ball owned up to a few of his shortcomings. And he made what a bit, of, it sounds like it could be a bit of a surprise admission that he's not really what Newfoundlanders and Labradorians typically look for in a politician. Have a listen. Now, Tom 
was right earlier when he said that I'm a poor fit, I guess, for a big mouth politician. When issues are gray, I refuse to pretend that they are black and white. Sometimes I can't help myself by attempting to explain the complexity of the situation. Now, this speech comes at the halfway point into the Dwight Ball's government at a time when his personal popularity is low and his party has just a meager lead in the polls. He's now trying to frame himself as the calm, reasonable politician in the crazy world of Donald Trump. He's trying to convince voters that unexciting is what they really want in a premier. And I know that we are Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and that historically we have chosen leaders full of bombast who often prefer to pick a fight rather than settle a dispute. But now we find ourselves in a time where careful and informed decisions should rule the day. Where collaboration, not conflict, will be the key to our success. No, I'm not like Donald Trump. And to be quite frank, I'm not like Paul Davis or Danny Williams either. And I will not apologize for that. I'm not going to ignore facts to feed talking points. I don't know if anyone has actually uh, compared Dwight Ball to Donald Trump before. Peter. Yeah, that's a bit of an odd comparison. It's not something that I found people are sitting there going, hmm, I find there's so many similarities. But <laughs> one of the challenges is, of course, that Ball doesn't know who he's going to be up against in the next election because both the NDP and the PCs are looking for their new leader. So. Right. It's really now a challenge of he's trying to frame himself against opponents that he doesn't really know who they're going to be. So yeah. he's picking Donald Trump to compare himself to or not. But there <laughs> The you most go. important question about last night, how was dinner? Uh, a $500 dinner? Not worth 500 bucks. <laughs> 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 but uh, nobody's paying that for the steak. Uh, no, it's no. a fundraiser. Was it good, though? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It Actually, well done steak. Okay. You know, the good convention dessert. center always does a decent yeah. job. Nice. All right. Uh, speaking of food, the food mm -hmm. fishery wraps right. up this weekend. And so uh, a lot of folks hoping to get out on the water because this is it. Yeah, but before we get to that, oh, yes. oh, right. we've we got something else to talk about. This is great. Uh, camouflage clothing is getting a lot of attention this week in Cornerbrook. Yeah, all this week, the West Coast Morning Show has been hosting a Show Me Your Camo contest, <laughs> asking people to share their, their favorite camo-inspired fashion. They've been overwhelmed with the entries. Oh, my. Ryan, oh, you like to hunt. Absolutely. Does your wife have an outfit like that? Uh, no, she does Or that? No, she does not. <laughs> that is excellent. Yeah, fantastic. I'm, I think the Duck Dynasty folks would, uh, <laughs> would love to see that. Oh, wow. very nice. And apparently nice they and just cute. got tons and tons of photos. Kids in camo, in fathers and sons in camo. Awesome. All camo babies all in camo. <laughs> Love it. Now my little guys, both little guys do have uh, some camo overalls. So uh, we've got camo gear at my house, no question about it. Nothing says uh, love like camouflage. dead birds in camo. <laughs> oh, how sweet. Nice. They'll have a tough time picking a winner out of those. I, don't know I think how. they will. Oh, oh look that's at a that. nice one. Yeah. Beautiful. Wow. Very cool. Okay, so you won't need some camo when you go out on the water no. this weekend There's to get your fish. There's another good segue. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, have a look again at the winds are going to be the most important part of the forecast for many hoping to hit the water this weekend. Yeah, we do have some showers and drizzle lingering into the early parts of Saturday. Those are your current winds. You can see where uh, they'll be strongest along that Atlantic coastline from St. John's to St. Anthony up into southeastern Labrador for the early morning hours of Saturday. And for those hoping to hit the water early, which most of course do, just watch for those gusts in that 50, even 60 kilometer per hour range from St. John's to Bonavista. Uh, winds will ease off as we work throughout the day along the northeast coast. It's a relatively light wind for most of the day in the Gulf of St. Lawrence along the south coast. Now, as we roll into the overnight hours of Saturday and in through Sunday morning, winds strengthen again with our next system coming in uh, from, the, uh, from the northwest. And you can see those winds strengthening through Labrador. By the time we get to Sunday morning, it's pretty strong wind. In fact, uh, for the coast of Labrador, even the west coast of the island. Winds really pick up for everybody through Sunday afternoon into Sunday evening. So keep that in mind if you're heading out on the water later Sunday that winds will pick up right across the island. If you want to see this map again uh, in motion, you can do so on my Facebook page and I'll have your full forecast details for the weekend coming up in just a few minutes. Carolyn.
Up next, we take to the squash court and find out why the sport is getting a lot of attention lately. Well, and stick around because later on the show, we'll hear St. John's entertainer Mick Davis tickling the ivories and entertaining CBC Crosstalk listeners. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it may come as a surprise for some, but Saturday is National Squash Day, and the Ac Arena has big plans to help the sport grow. All day, there will be events on the two courts at the St. John's facility with plans to try and attract new players. But as Here and Now's Jeremy Eaton learned this week, the sport is already on the rise. So it's squash day in Canada and right across our nation clubs have special events going on. Here at the Ac Arena we have from 9 to 5 we're trying to keep a continuous game of cutthroat going. Now that sounds a little harsh but basically three or more players will be on court. One player serves the ball, whoever wins the point stays and plays the next point. Whoever's unsuccessful waits on the back of the glass. So we want to keep a continuous marathon game going from 9 in the morning until 5 p.m. at night. So we're asking anybody at all uh, from the public to come in. We have rackets and goggles available. You don't need to be a member at the fitness center to come and participate in Squash Day in Canada. In addition, on this court over here, we'll have one of our club coaches giving free introductory lessons to anyone that would like to stop by. 
This past year, we had 161 uh, members in Squash Newfoundland and Labrador, and that's basically up from 31 members in 2015, 2016. So that's 161 kids and adults who are playing organized tournaments, leagues, or taking part in lessons. Uh, unfortunately, right now, it's mostly here at the Aqua Arena and in CBS. Other than that, there's players in Gander, in Grand Falls, in Stephenville, Cornerbrook, and Goose Bay who are playing, but it's not necessarily organized and they're not getting out to play in tournaments. But we're hoping to have them contact us and we'll get some events going for them as well. I actually kind of got dragged into it in a way because Kenny plays basketball with my dad and he was like, hey, we're doing, we play squash and you know, you should join. So I tried it and ended up liking it. So yeah. I like, like, I've done a bunch of team sports in the past, and I like how it's kind of one-on-one. -on -one. It's just you versus another player. You learn a lot of, like, independence through it, where it's always been team sports for me. Uh, I've been finding it's actually growing a lot more than when I first started. Uh, back when I first started, there's really not that many kids who were playing that were around my age. And now, as you can see, there's a lot more kids. Uh, the program here has definitely developed and has picked up over the past few years. Um, over in CBS, there's a lot of kids, and we've actually even had some interest coming out from Stephenville and sort of from Grand Falls area. So it definitely seems to be picking up, and I hopefully it will just keep growing as years come. While well, amidst rising tensions in northern Iraq, we'll head to the region to speak with one Newfoundlander about why it just became a whole lot harder for him to leave.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Ryan, earlier in the show, you gave us a good preview for folks who are headed out on the water of the winds and the wave conditions. Yep. Yep, getting a few of the last fish of the season. Yep. For those of us who are going to be uh, much more firmly planted on the land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but who want to spend some time outdoors, That's, that's perhaps, right. Yeah, know, that's right. Uh, okay, so Sunday, certainly the better day in the east along the northeast coast of the island. Uh, Saturday is looking a little on the unsettled side in terms of uh, the winds, I should say, are going to be the uh, an issue and some lingering drizzle possibilities. Uh, showers tonight, it's more of a drizzle for the northeast coast uh, for Saturday, but again, it's the northerly winds and the temperatures that are going to be a little on the cool side. Clouds are going to dominate on Saturday along that northeast coast. Brighter for Sunday. Uh, for Labrador, it's a better forecast. Saturday, not so much for Sunday as our next system will move in Saturday night and into Sunday. Current temps right now, Five, six degrees uh, from Cartwright to St. Anthony, warming up towards 10 degrees in St. John's. Okay, again, warmest you can see with the wind flow here from the northwest, obviously warmest along the south coast, nicely shielded from those northerly winds. 13 degrees along the Buren Peninsula right now. And again, those winds will continue to be a factor along that Atlantic coastline through the overnight tonight and in through the early morning hours for those hitting the water uh, tomorrow morning. Been still watching a few lingering showers along the west coast into central. Again, a bit of drizzle uh, patchy, but certainly on the go here in Metro over the next couple of hours as well. This is the low for the weekend just now rolling into Hudson Bay, but it will be moving uh, quickly into Labrador by the time we get to later Saturday. Here's how it all times out. Watch your timeline here. 6 p.m. tonight and we can see those uh, patchy periods of drizzle, maybe a steadier shower possible through the mid to late evening as those winds continue from the north. It's going to be a cool one. We're clearing out though by the time we get to around Saturday morning and uh, just a lingering shower possibility from the port of port down through the port of Basque region. And again, watching for that possibility of a bit of drizzle uh, from Gander down through Terra Nova, Bonavista to St. John's for the early morning hours, especially. The chance drops off towards midday, but won't rule it out for the afternoon as well uh, as winds will continue in from the northwest. Zero for in and low uh, inland and low lying areas of central parts of Newfoundland towards the west with low single digits there. And you can see we're below zero uh, for western parts of Labrador. Frost advisories are in place with temperatures going to be so light tonight for central west parts of the island. Winds becoming light here, so a very good chance that we'll see some frost. Uh, even uh, a little uh, heavy frost possibilities for uh, again places like Badger towards the Humber Valley. By the time we roll through to the day tomorrow, again, I think those clouds linger even into the afternoon for Bonavista St. John's. Slight drizzle possibilities, but really clearing up through the evening and into the overnight hours. And here comes our next system rolling in through Sunday. There's 7 a.m. Sunday morning, now pushing into Happy Valley Goose Bay. It will move into Newfoundland through the day on Sunday as well. We'll talk about that with your long range forecast coming up. Mainly cloudy skies, a chance of drizzle, as I mentioned early on. Still a possibility into the afternoon, uh, less so, but yeah, on the menu. Uh, can't rule it out. Winds in from the northwest, becoming light mid to late afternoon, and that's really when that drizzle possibility will end for St. John's and along that northeast coast. Just 7, 8 degrees, 6 in the Bay of Exploits and Twillingate tomorrow. We should get to some double digits, not ruling it out for the Buren Peninsula, but more so for the Burgio Porta Basque region, 8, 9 degrees up the west coast with the sun cloud mix, and it's a beautiful day across Labrador tomorrow after the wet snow mixing in over the last couple of days, especially in the west. Certainly some increase in clouds here, but winds from the west southwest. Uh, a better direction compared to the last couple of days. Such a forecast Sunday, Monday and beyond. Coming up, Peter. Well, a Newfoundlander has found himself at the center of rising tensions in northern Iraq. On Monday, the Kurdish region overwhelmingly voted for independence, which angered the Iraqi government. Today, international flights to the region were cut off in retaliation. There are military exercises and threats of cutting off land borders as well. In the middle of all this is Richard White. He's originally from St. John's, but he's right now in northern Iraq. So first of all, how did you end up teaching in northern Iraq? Well, I mean, I've always had an interest in the Middle East and regional issues, and education has always been a passion of mine. So when I saw the opportunity to be in a place where I could combine both of those interests, I jumped at it. It didn't really matter that it was a tricky place to be. 
So speaking of tricky, there was this vote, uh, the referendum on independence. We've now seen the Iraqi government is upset with the result. What has that meant for you as a foreigner on the ground in that area? Um, well, the Iraqi government released a 12-item agenda addressed at the Kurdish government. And among those that would affect foreigners would be they demanded the closure of all foreign consulates in the Kurdish region. They've also, as of 6 p.m. today, local time, they, de they enacted an embargo on all international flights. So right now there are no flights out of the Kurdish region that do not enter Iraq itself. So what does that mean for you if you decided that you wanted to leave? To leave right now? Iraq is interesting because the Kurdish region itself, you do not need a visa to enter because it is very autonomous. But to enter Iraq, I would need a visa. So I would have to wait to apply for a visa. And then with that visa, I could go to Baghdad and then I could take a flight. So with the tensions increasing right now with Iraq uh, and other countries having military exercises in the area, how unsettling is that knowing that you can't just leave if you wanted to? I mean, it is very disconcerting because you generally assume worst case scenario just to be safe. But at the same time, most of what I've heard from people here that, have, that live here, that have been through this before, it will blow over is the assumption. So myself, like many foreigners, have chosen to remain despite the difficulties associated with leaving during this time. So at any moment, have you thought, what am I doing here? Maybe I could have gone and taught English in a more stable country? I could have, but I mean, for me personally, I wouldn't have gotten as much out of that experience as I have here. So what's the next step for you? Um, I'm planning a couple of years here, and then I'd like to... I mean, given my experience in a developing region, it's really piqued my interest. So I'd like to do a short course or program in international development and then hopefully something with the Foreign Service or... Okay, well, good luck, stay safe, and thanks for speaking with us. All right, thank you so much. Up next, a volunteer fire chief on why he worries every time his unit is called to an accident scene.
Welcome back to Here and Now. When disaster strikes, emergency crews are the first ones fighting their way to the front lines. But a volunteer fire chief from Come By Chance says motorists still aren't mindful of first responders. In fact, sometimes they're downright disrespectful. Tonight, Chief Dwayne Antle is sharing some of those frustrations. The nightmare scenario for me is that I go to the highway and at the end of that call, I've got to go knock on one of my firefighters' doors and, uh, and say that person's not coming home. You think about, you know, think about that for a second, how that's going to feel. And we, and we think it doesn't happen, and we think it can't happen to us. Uh, just two weeks ago, an RCMP officer in Nova Scotia stopped on the highway and was fatally injured. Uh, a study that comes to mind that was done by the University of Cincinnati that looked at the safety of emergency responders on highways. In a four-year period, 17 firefighters lost their lives in controlled scenes on highways. Uh, so, you know, what does that tell us? It, it tells us that it certainly can happen, and it doesn't matter if you're paid, if you're a volunteer, uh, that doesn't make a difference. We're seeing more speed and we're seeing more damage because of that speed. Uh, accident scenes now compared to 10 years ago, and, and they've always been bad. Uh, but I do see a difference in the amount of damage that's done. Cars are safer now than they've ever been, and, and thankfully for that, because uh, I think you know one of the things that uh, is a contributing factor to the, the numbers of fatalities, uh, I believe, is speed. We've been on the side of the road and people have passed us going so fast before we get our signage up that it's just unbelievable. Like, I mean, it's actually scary when you're getting out of the truck. Firstly, obey the signage. Uh, obey the directions that you're being given to pass through the scene safely. The other thing is stay away from the cell phone. Put the cell phone down. I know you think, uh, some people think that maybe it's cool to get that shot. You know, but there's a lot of things around that as well that you need to understand. Just imagine uh, somebody's child is in an incident and they learn about that incident because you posted something on Facebook, you know, before they even knew about it. Well, if you see these two characters hobbling around Cornerbrook, take a minute to chat with them. This is Megan Bush and she's using a marionette named June Carroll to collect stories about lumberjacks and people in this province who used to work in logging camps. Yes, it's part of a weekend arts festival in the city. Bush says she'll set up uh, on West Street Saturday night and hopes people will stop and tell her or her lumberjack-like puppet stories. Looks a little wooden to me, though. <laughs>
better than that. Well, it's time now for our Young Athlete of the Day. We want to introduce you to Daniel Ingram of Random Harbor. Daniel is three years old and just finished his second year of Timbit soccer in Clarenville. Awesome job, Daniel. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. All right, so Friday weather. Yeah. It again, Saturday, not so great here in the east. Great day in Labrador, and we're going to kind of flop for uh, Sunday, really improving here in the east, not so much for the west and in the Labrador. Uh, let's uh, break it all down. Now, there is the uh, system that brought the rain 80 millimeters, by the way, or near that for uh, Cape Pine along the southern Avalon. So those rainfall warnings uh, were certainly warranted uh, across southern parts of the Avalon. Amounts uh, not nearly that uh, high here across the metro region. Uh, looked like some stations did top out in that 20, 30 millimeter range. However, uh, again, in behind some lingering drizzle and shower activity through tonight, lingering into Saturday across the northeast coast. That forecast in a second. And this is the next low, which is rolling into Hudson Bay. Looks well to the north right now, and it is, but it's moving at a pretty good pace. Increasing the clouds tomorrow over at western parts of Labrador and even by tomorrow night bringing some uh, rain and snow mixing in. There's that uh, drizzle possibility along the northeast coast for Saturday through the day, easing off as the winds become lighter into the uh, later part of the afternoon. A reminder, frost advisories are in effect for central over towards the west part of the island for tonight uh, and in through the early morning hours of Saturday. Temperatures really don't recover all that much tomorrow. We're talking seven, eight, nine degrees uh, for a good portion of the island, looking at possibility of some double digits towards the southwest coast. And again, brighter as you work your way towards the west as well and up into eastern parts of Labrador. A look into Lab West, just four degrees. Increase in clouds looks like, though, the precip holds off until Saturday night and in through uh, Saturday evening in through uh, the overnight as that uh, front rolls through. Then some clearing on the other side. I think Labrador City will see some sun breaks sa Saturday afternoon. Not so sure about Happy, Happy Valley Goose Bay, but the possibility is there. The front brings clouds and showers to the northern peninsula, western parts of Newfoundland for Sunday afternoon. I think it's a sun cloud mix uh, with some evening, late evening uh, possibilities uh, for central parts of Newfoundland. Uh, but certainly the risk is there for some evening showers if you do have some Sunday evening plans. And there across southeastern Newfoundland, St. John's, the Avalon and the Buren Peninsula, I think we will stay dry on Sunday. Temperatures again a little more seasonal. In fact, right on seasonal, 12, 13 degrees across most of the island. Cooler on the other side of that front with late day flurry possibilities in Happy Valley Goose Bay in the southeast uh, as temperatures drop behind that cold front. That front will then move eastward, swings through uh, with a shower possibility for the early, early morning hours of Monday. Keeping an eye on this system, you can see this forecast model edging it closer to the Avalon with shower possibilities on Monday. It is much farther west than any other forecast model right now. I think it does stay offshore at this point at least. 10, 12 degrees on Monday, not half bad with sun and cloud possibilities, a uh, sun and cloud mix, a uh, uh, good possibility for most. Just watching for a chance of showers along that north to mid Labrador coast. And there's your uh, seven day trend, which is actually pretty good. A solid area of high pressure coming in, building temperatures Monday through Wednesday and even into Thursday of next week, although Thursday, Friday, a little uncertain. And there are your uh, seven days in Labrador, which again, really peaking temperature wise Tuesday into Wednesday. Thanks, Ryan. Looking at some national and international news tonight, Canada's finance minister faced some tough questions today at a town hall meeting on tax reform. Bill Morneau met with people in Oakville, Ontario this morning. Therefore, we're going to listen to people. So the conclusions that you're assuming have been reached have not been reached. Uh, we will be considering what you have to say. Morneau says he wants to close loopholes that allow wealthy Canadians to avoid higher tax rates, but... Critics of the plan say it would hurt small business owners and doctors. The RCMP is being criticized again today following a ruling that it failed to properly equip its officers to deal with a deadly rampage in 2014. The force came in for the criticism soon after the ruling in Moncton, New Brunswick. I think it's been damaging to the relationship with the community. I think it breaks the trust. I think the members are still very hurt and... Um, and feel um, unsupported. Yeah. It's been proven today that it fails to support the rank and file. These tragedies happen. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. 
The court heard how Moncton RCMP officers were out armed when Justin Bork went on his rampage. He had a semi automatic rifle and a 12 gauge shotgun. Carbine rifles were approved for use by the RCMP three years earlier, but not put into use in Moncton. The judge found police guilty of failure to provide necessary equipment under the the Canada Labor Code, the Mounties face a fine of up to $1 million. Sentencing arguments will be heard in November. U.S. President Donald Trump says more help is on the way for Puerto Rico. He says a substantial federal mobilization is underway to assist the U.S. territory. We will not rest, however, until the people of Puerto Rico are safe. These are great people. We want them to be safe and sound and secure, and we will be there every day until that happens. Trump says more than 10,000 federal personnel are involved in the effort. His comments come amid mounting criticism over the handling of the crisis. Instead of focusing on relief efforts, Trump also talked about Puerto Rico's heavy debt load and how it must be addressed. Public health officials are investigating a salmonella outbreak linked to frozen raw breaded chicken products. 13 cases have been reported in four provinces, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. All of them happened between June and August. Four people required hospitalization, but no deaths have been reported. The public health agency has not linked the outbreak to any particular brand. It reminds consumers to thoroughly cook raw chicken products. Don't eat them raw. Canadian pop country singer Shania Twain is back with some brand new music. Life's about joy, life's about pain. It's all about the giving and the will to walk away. I'm ready to be Her latest album entitled Now was released today. And this is the first single, Life's About to Get Good. It's been 15 years since Twain put out a new record. She also is coming home to Canada to headline the Canadian Football League's Grey Cup halftime show in November. The tour for the new album starts next May. Well, staying with music, but this time a little closer to home. Yes, our colleagues at CBC Radio had a special guest in their St. John's studio over the lunch hour. If you must leave, my little baby, take care. Mick Davis dropped by to play some piano and guitar, sing a few of his songs, and take calls from the audience of CBC Radio listeners. Yeah, many of you know Davis as the lead singer of the always popular band, the Novaks, but he's also enjoying a successful solo career. And keeping with that music theme, we just want to keep on rolling here. To celebrate 25 years of Music NL, our online team has been asking for you to vote for your favorite local songs. Yes, call it a jammiversary. CBC NL is a rating a slew of songs from best jam by a power couple to best love jam, even the best tune for feeling homesick. Yeah, you can head to our website to cast your vote, but we want to give you a little bit of a sneak peek at some of the songs that are in the running. Hidden and useless under us 
looking at our beautiful viewer picture of the day. This one was taken at Devil's Point. Sunset at Devil's Point. And I'll even tell you it was in Labrador, but which community is that closest to? The answer after the break. Finally, the tell-all political interview you've been waiting for. Well, actually, in the words of 22 Minutes, the federal NDP leadership race is, quotes, the most boring leadership race in the history <laughs> of, wait for it, time. Oh, that's pretty harsh. MP uh, Jagmeet Singh sat down with 22 Minutes' Sean Majumder this week to talk about love in the face of hatred and their common connection, Newfoundland. Have a look. Why don't you just admit? <laughs> to all Canadians that you're a radical Hindu Muslim <laughs> working closely with the Buddhist Brotherhood <laughs> to try to impose Jesus Murphy's law on all Canadians. Why don't you just come clean? You know what, uh, you know what? I'll do this today on 22 Minutes. I'll come clean. Beautiful. <laughs> you and I have a lot in common, which I think is really interesting. We do. It's pretty cool. A couple of young brown kids growing up in Newfoundland. Go figure. Right? We have a different story. Uh, exactly. I'm, I'm a proud townie. I'm a proud Bayman, <laughs> which, I mean, you and I would be getting into to fights. We'd get into scraps. Uh, we'd get into in scraps, Newfoundland. that's right. But as soon as he exit Newfoundland, that's we're, right. brothers. we're brothers. We're brothers. <laughs> we're brothers. <laughs> Newfoundlanders. <laughs> Newfoundlanders. That's what we are. So you've been screeched in. I have. But recently, was that the first time you were screeched at? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, not the first time. The first time to that, to that level. That was wild. That was pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you have a turban. Yeah. She just got it confused with other, you know, scary dudes with turbans, like Jafar from Aladdin. Is he working for your campaign? You can look right in this camera right now, and you can promise Canadians there's, there's not some videotape out there of you on an E-Talk Canada bus with Rick the Temp <laughs> telling him how much you love grabbing bare naked ladies by their Nelly Furtados. That, there's no such video. There's no video out there. Canada, there is no such video. I can confirm this. <laughs> Well, I gotta say to you, man, thank you so much. Good luck with everything. Do not touch me! Do not touch me! Do not, do not touch me, ma'am. Get away from me. I will call the police. <laughs> oh, they're Nelly Furtados. <laughs> nice. That Great was line. Good. <laughs> All right. Well, from that to a look at uh... who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Birthday greetings to Marjorie Philpot. She's celebrating her 91st birthday.
Happy birthday to Annie Green of Winterton, who turned 90 on Monday. Happy 53rd anniversary to Mamie and Eugene Newhook of Southbrook. Congratulations to Ronald and Olive O'Brien, who celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary on Monday. Happy 94th birthday to Bertha Comden of Howley, who celebrated on September 23rd. Happy 52nd anniversary to Rex and Elsie Short of Robert's Arm. Happy 96th birthday to Ira Troke of Glenwood. Happy 90th birthday to Winnie Rose of Ochre Pit Cove. Anniversary greetings going out to Albert and Helen Pike of St. Lawrence. They're celebrating 58 years of marriage. 61st anniversary greetings to Earl and Joyce Perry of Bloomfield. David and May Butt from Carboneer are celebrating their 54th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Happy 55th wedding anniversary today to Jake and Violet King of Broadcove. Happy 90th birthday to Regina Gulledge of Curling, now living in the Bay of Islands. Happy 50th anniversary tomorrow to Margaret and Eric Guilford of Clarenville. A special happy birthday to Gertie Burton, formerly of Wesleyville, now living in Badger Key. She turns 90 tomorrow. Happy birthday to Bessie Taylor of Raleigh. She celebrated her 91st birthday on Wednesday. Greetings to Ronald and Emma Collins of Indian Bay, who celebrated their 56th wedding anniversary on Wednesday. Happy 52nd anniversary to Stuart and Laura Pye of Lodge Bay, Labrador. Happy 71st wedding anniversary to Merle and Madge Berkshire of Elliott's Cove, Random Island, who will celebrate on th their special day on October 3rd. Happy 90th birthday to Marianne Skinner of Lourdes. It's a diamond anniversary for Henry and Edna Crocker of Greens Harbor. Congratulations. Happy 52nd anniversary to Gladys and Junior Ford. Happy birthday to Helen Humphreys of Hare Bay, celebrating on her 92nd birthday on October 1st. 90th birthday greetings to Annie Griffin of St. Kieran's, now living in Freshwater, Placentia Bay. Happy 97th birthday to Max Ford of Baird Island, Fogo Island, who celebrated on Sunday, September 24th. Happy birthday to Nelson Bennett of Pasadena, celebrating his 90th birthday today. Happy 50th wedding anniversary today to Robert and Margaret Brown of Dover. Happy anniversary to Gordon and Gladys White of Catalina, who are celebrating their 64th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Happy 52nd anniversary on October 1st to Ren and Myrtle Cunard of Brig Bay. Happy 59th wedding anniversary to Shirley and Ed Eastman of Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 53rd anniversary to Verna and Ward Pye of Lodge Bay. Happy 90th birthday to Ron Simpson of St. John's. Happy 50th anniversary to Gord and Pat Sheehan. Happy 50th also going out to Basil and Linda Buckle of Cornerbrook. Another golden anniversary, Arthur and Maxine Freak of Norris Arm North are celebrating tomorrow. Happy 71st anniversary to Everett and Laura Moore from Clark's Beach. Martha Jane Peril of Pines Cove will be 96 on October 1st. She now lives in St. Anthony. All right, quick look at the next three days, and you can see a uh, pretty solid Sunday on the island uh, for the east, I should say. You know, Saturday, okay in the west, and uh, those increasing clouds and showers on Sunday. Labrador is certainly the better day for Saturday. Uh, okay, viewer picture. Before the break, we asked you where was that picture taken? Uh, and it's a very good question. One you're going to have to wait a few <laughs> extra seconds for. He as said I it was by Devil's Point, yes. I think, in Labrador. That's yep. right. Melville Williams took the picture, and here we are. That's right near Rigolette. Oh. That's right. Just, just outside of Rigolette uh, was what uh, Melville Williams said, uh, and a beautiful sunset picture there. And thanks for your patience as I ran all yeah. the way over to my weather computer to play that graphic You did for that you. very quickly. That was impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Must be Friday. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Friday cobwebs. Yes, happy Friday to everyone, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, whether you're going to be uh, doing a little bit of work around the house, especially mm -hmm. Saturday, or heading out on the fishery, uh, you know, I guess there's a little bit of something for everyone. I know it's fall, you've been teasing me all week, Ryan. You know, I, I'll just have to accept it. I'm not gonna get any more of those 20 degree days. No, that's right, you're out of but luck. But we now. had so many of them, <laughs> Yes, so. we did, we had a great summer, no yeah, complaints. Really My memories did. will just have to keep me warm. Yes, that's right. <laughs> have a great weekend, everyone. Good night. Good night.